Let me say happy Father's Day to all of you. We are so glad that you are here to be a part of what's going to happen today. You know, Mother's Day is a huge day at church because everybody wants to come and be with mom. Uh, Dad, we often sort of get, I don't know, second, third, I don't know. But we're glad that you are here today uh, for Father's Day. And uh, in honor, dads, I want to talk about something light today to keep it uh, in an area that you would know and like. I want to talk to you about death. You know, this is the time of year when I spend a lot of time uh, killing stuff. You know, bugs, that kind of, all kinds of things around the house. It's, it's this time of the year when they come out, and it's generally Dad's issue in homes to take care of those kind of things. You know, the interesting thing, if you watch bugs and you want to become a trained bug assassin like me, uh, you watch them, and they just walk around on our planet with such impunity. I mean, they wander around like they own the place. It's almost as if they don't realize that they have an enemy, and that their enemy is bigger than they are and smarter than they are, and that their enemy ultimately wants to destroy them. And, you know, the interesting thing is, is that me and my fellow bug killers through the years, we have worked on uh, ways to lure bugs into things where, you know, bugs are smart enough that you can't just stand at them and say, die, bug, and they'll, they'll, they'll voluntarily die. But if you're smart enough, you can lure a bug to the place where it will actively participate in its own death. It's hard to believe. Now, why would they do that? Well, again, they're smart enough to know that if you're just trying to come at them with something, like you're going to smash them with something, then they'll try to run away. But if you deceive them, and the deception is always that there is actually a promise of something the bug wants, there's the promise of life at the end of it. When you deceive them with the promise of life, then the bug will willingly participate in its own death. In fact, I brought a couple of our little tools with us this day. This is, this is what I would call an ant infestation uh, center. Uh, ants probably see it like as the ant buffet. Uh, inside of this is some ant food, and ants apparently really like this, and they will go inside and they think it's very, very tasty food, but in fact, this food for the ants has been infected, and it will be the last meal that ant ever eats. But it's not only that, it, the, the ant infestation center doesn't work so quick that the ant actually dies so that other ants can see it and go, oh, don't go in there, the ants die. This ant is allowed to live long enough that he can actually leave the ant infestation center and go back and take the infection back to his little ant babies, and you get a whole wiped-out ant family. Um, this, this thing I brought, and I haven't really tried this to see if it actually works here today, but many of you will know what that is, and I'm not going to touch it because uh, that's, that's flypaper, as you know. And, you know... It, flies love the light, and if you take this and you hang it in a place where, where there's light, flies will, fly will, a fly will directly go toward this because apparently there's a scent on it that the flies like, like the flies think they're going to have a little brown chicka brown brown, and, and they fly to this, but it's the last flight the fly ever has. They wind up there, and they just die. You deceive them with, with the allure of life, with the allure of something they want, but they fly voluntarily to their own death. Now, only a bug would be that stupid, right? Only a bug. It, the truth is, you, you don't have to turn very far into the news or watch celebrities or, let, let's forget celebrities, talk about your own family or your own friends and Listen to what goes on in their life, and you see every day that people voluntarily participate in things that they ruin their marriage, they ruin their family, they ruin their workplace, they ruin their soul, and they do it voluntarily. They walk into their own death at own, as if they voluntarily signed up for it. In fact, Human beings seem to walk around. I mean, we, we choose to violate our own values, the very things that we hold on to, that we believe provide life and sustain us. Why do we give in to what we know will lead to death? Why do we walk voluntarily toward it? Why do we eventually do dark things that will lead to us eventually being ashamed of it? 
Well, the Bible says, at least in part, it's because human beings have an enemy. And he's bigger than us. And he spends every day trying to figure out how to lure us to our death. In fact, the Bible calls him uh, the enemy or the evil one. And his primary name is, is tempter. And his primary weapon is simply temptation. Now, we've been in this series for the last few weeks called Failure to Connect. It's a series on prayer. And we've been learning from Jesus how we should pray because most of us feel like we don't do it very well. We're following the lines of Jesus' own disciples who said, Lord, teach us to pray. And so Jesus said, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth just like it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Help us to be dependent on God every moment. Lead us and, and deliver us from uh, evil. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from the evil one. That's where we find ourselves today. Last week, we wound up talking about uh, the problem of forgiving just as. And today, Jesus teaches us how to be delivered from temptation. Temptation is what our enemy does. It's what he uses to destroy our lives and our soul. And dealing with it is one of the most important topics that any person can learn about. So what I want to do today is I want us to look together at what the Bible has to say about dealing with temptation. In fact, I want to take you to one of the classic passages in the New Testament of the Bible that deals with this area of temptation. It's written by a guy named Paul... Uh, who writes a lot of the New Testament. He's writing to a church that he helped start. It's a church in Corinth, so the place we find it is in a letter called 1 Corinthians. He wrote it to Corinth, so it's written to the Corinthians. And in this, he's doing what I'm trying to do with you today. He's just fleshing out for them how it is that you live out this prayer of, you know, deliver us from temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. Lead us not into temptation. So, I want to read this to you, and before I begin to read it, you just need to know that Paul uses as an illustration uh, something that many of them would have known, almost all of them would have known very well. It is an example out of the older part of the Bible. Many of you won't know this example, but Paul uses it as an example and an illustration of people who were destroyed, people who were trying to follow God who were destroyed by their own temptation. Uh, let me read this to you. Here's what he says, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it's written, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. In one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as an example and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. Paul's just saying that we, we know about Jesus. Jesus has been the fulfillment of everything that God's been doing. The people he's writing to are followers of Christ like many of you are. He says, so if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common among people. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you're tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Now, that last part that I read to you is one of the central statements in the Bible that Christians always used in learning how to deal with temptation. And today, I just want to walk you through that one passage and make some observations about temptation. Uh, the first one comes where Paul says, no temptation has seized you except what is common among people. Here, here's, here's the first observation. You should expect temptation. You will be tempted. You have an enemy, and you will be tempted, so don't be surprised. Don't be caught off guard. Don't be shocked, and, and don't be disappointed in yourself. The prayer that Jesus teaches us to pray this then is how you should pray, deliver us from temptation, does not mean deliver us from the experience of being tempted. Because temptation is something that is common to every human being. Every human being on the face of the earth has been and, and will be tempted. Jesus himself was tempted. 
Temptation is a part of what it means to be human being. We pray, deliver us from the experience, not of being tempted, but from giving in and being destroyed by the temptation. Nobody's temptation free. Temptation is just a part of the normal life for a human being. So one of the most important things that you can do is to begin to realize what is it that tempts you. For some of you, it may be a sign that says hot and fresh, and behind it, you know, is a box of Krispy Kremes. For some of you, it may be the words S-A-L-E, and you can't stop yourself from buying. For others of you, it might be in a bottle or a pill or a fix or on a website. It might be porn. For others of you, it might just be the temptation to say, well, I don't have any of that, and I'm tempted to look down on people who give in to things that I'm not tempted by to feel a little bit better. What is the temptation that you face? Now, let me explain something to you about the word that Jesus uses uh, when he says in the prayer, deliver us from, uh, you know, lead us not into temptation. It's the same word that Paul uses here. See, we tend to restrict this idea of temptation to certain kind of areas, and it really limits us into seeing what our enemy is doing. For example, um, if I were to ask the guys here this morning, how many of you, when you hear the word temptation, honestly, just as honestly as you can, how many of you, when you hear the word temptation, the next thing that comes into your mind is sex? Now, I know you not personally are tempted uh, in any way sexually, but other guys you know are. We tend to restrict it to that kind of area. But the word translated temptation can also just mean being tested. The core idea of temptation is it's, it's allowing myself to be torn away from God. It's whatever would pull me away from my good, loving Heavenly Father, my Father who's closer than the air I breathe, who's with me every day, who wants his kingdom to come on earth, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than all I could ask or think. It's what would tear me away from living in connection with my good Father. That's what temptation is. And what's at stake in temptation is the human soul. Giving tempta into temptation is allowing whatever it is to pull me away from God the God who loves me, the God who's with me, that's what is at stake. And the tempter's not stupid. The tempter's not going to stand by and yell at you, hey, choose death. I mean, he's not going to yell at you to do something that you know you don't want to do. Probably for most of us, the biggest temptations in our lives are not the most dramatic ones. It's the one that's really most subtle to lure us away from being with God. In fact, if you look back at the list that Paul gave us in 1 Corinthians 10 that I read through with you a minute ago, you'll notice that he begins with, with four different kind of temptations. He says, first is the temptation of worshiping an idol. And then he talks about in verse 8 of the temptation of, of being sexually immoral. And then he goes on and says, and there's the temptation of testing God, of just shaking your fist at God and going, God, give me what I want, how I want it, when I want it, or, you know, I'm done with you, God. Now, my guess is if I said to you, hey, let's have a show of hands on how many of you today would say, oh, yeah, today I've worshipped an idol and I've committed sexual immorality and I'm about to renounce God. There probably wouldn't be very many temptations in this place. I mean, many of us that have given in to those temptations today. But there's another temptation that Paul lists, and it is rampant in Christians, and it happens Almost every Sunday, he says, and do not grumble. Uh-oh. Know any grumblers around here? See, the purpose of the evil one is to separate you from God. And whatever is most likely to get you off track, even if it's something as subtle as grumbling because other people will sort of support you in it, it separates you from the Father. Grumbling is just as, an effect, as effective as idolatry or adultery. In fact, sometimes it's more effective because other good people will join in with you at the same time. And the evil one doesn't just tempt you with what's wrong. Sometimes I'm tested with not doing what I know is right. He tempts us not to do the things that 
we know God wants us to do. And it may be the, the most important temptations that goes on in the life of a lot of Christ followers I, that I know is the temptation not just to be the person you know God wants you to be. And the biggest temptation that keeps you from it is busyness. You just to live a life that's so busy that you can't really serve anyone. You can't deeply connect with God. You can't pray great prayers that will connect you with the soul. You're not regularly involved in worship because, of course, you can't do that because you're so busy. And in our world, busyness is not seen as a problem. It's seen as a virtue. See, our enemy doesn't have to destroy you. He can't... He can't literally destroy you. Unlike me who can take a fly swatter and kill a fly, I can smush a bud. Your enemy does not have the power to take your life. Our enemy is not as strong as God. He's not the equal of God. Our God is all-knowing, all-powerful, able to do exceedingly abundantly more than all we can ask or think. But our enemy is not like that. He's not the equal to God. His only power is to tempt you to voluntarily come to be voluntarily separated from God. Therefore, every human being that winds up with a destroyed soul does it of their own volition. The temptation battle that is, most, is the most important battle that you will ever fight. And some of you right now, you're in it up to your neck. The evil one will try to make it look like you are not because you're just doing things that everybody else is doing. And he'll make you think that giving in to this is no big deal. In fact, there's life at the end of it, but this is not a petty thing that we're talking about this. Again, I say to you, think about this. This is the truth. Every human being, when a human being winds up being separated, pulled away from God for all eternity, when they wind up being destroyed spiritually forever, every soul that winds up there does it voluntarily because the enemy has no power to destroy you on his own. Temptation is normal for human beings, so expect it. You are not the exception to the rule. There is no temptation except what's common to human beings, all men and women. And Paul continues, And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. God knows exactly how much you can bear, and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond that. Now, this is a statement, honestly, that many of you have heard, but it's almost always misquoted in the wrong place. Almost every time I hear this thing of God knows you and he won't allow more than you can bear, almost every time I hear that, people put it in terms of suffering. You're going through a really bad time, but take courage. God knows you and he will not let you suffer more than you can bear. Well, that's just factually untrue. People suffer more than they can bear every single day. People suffer all the way to death every single day, all around the planet, in every culture. Paul makes this statement in light of temptation. God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. God knows you, and he knows just how much you can bear, and he will not allow your enemy to push the limits beyond that. Now, that ought to be very encouraging to every one of us. This is a promise that everything that comes at me that would pull me away from the Father has already been sifted through the hands of my Father who knows me and knows what I can stand, and he is not allowing anything to come at me that can test me beyond my ability to stand it. But there's also kind of a sobering realization to this as well. This also means that no one can say when they are tempted, I couldn't help myself. It was more than I could stand. I had no choice but just to give in. God has not allowed human beings that excuse. God knows you. And he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. You can withstand anything that comes at you. God doesn't leave you with that excuse. In fact, in James 4, 7, James, the brother of Jesus, says, if you resist the devil, you resist the enemy, he will flee from you. He will run from you. But it will require that you resist. You have a very good father. 
And he's closer than the air you breathe. He's with you all the time. And he knows you. And he watches you real close. And he knows how much you can bear. But that means there are no excuses when you fail. And if you've been letting yourself off the hook by saying, well, if you just understood me and you knew what I came through and you knew what, all the things that had happened to me and you knew my circumstances were so bad and I'm just so weak, I don't have the strength to stand up to that. You are not telling yourself the truth. It's time you face the truth. Third observation. Paul says, But when you're tempted, he will also provide a way out. That's good news. When you're tempted, God won't allow you to be tempted beyond your, what you can bear. And God will always provide a way. God will make a way out. And in the few moments that I have remaining, and the, the rest of my time that I have in this talk today, I want to talk to you about actions that you need to take so that you can find God's way out. I want, I want to talk to you about the way out in every temptation, about part of being delivered from the temptation that plagues so many of you. I want to talk to you about what could be the next step for many of you. Each week, early in the service, a campus pastor will hold up this card and talk to you about Hold on to it. There are next steps that uh, I'll get with you with during the message. Well, this is that time. And I know normally I talk to you about this right near the end of the message. But today, I want to talk to you about next steps that, should be, that you should be thinking about taking. And they're outlined on the back of this card. One or both of these or all of these may, may be the thing that you need to take. And I know if you're here for the very first time today and all of this is coming at you and you don't know where you think about with God and you're not a follower of Christ yet, then maybe the only next step for you is that you begin to take the next step of I'll just come back. But these next steps, if you take them, even if you're not yet a follower of Christ, they can help you with the temptations that you face. I want to talk to you over the next few minutes about these and as I go through them, if you sense that this one is for you, if you would just check it, and then when the offering comes around, you just take this and place it in the offering. And every week we ask you to fill this out, and honestly, I get if you're here and you think it's sort of weird and you don't know why we want your information, really all we want is the opportunity to connect you. So if you just put your name and an email address or a phone where we could text you, uh, we just want to connect you and thank you for coming. And we pray for every card that's put in the offering. We pray for every person in the next step they're taking. We want to be a part in helping you become who God wants you to be. So let me talk to you about these next steps. The first one is this. If I had to name the single, single greatest emotional weapon that God has given us against temptation, it's a single word. It's the word joy. In Nehemiah 8.10, there's this classic statement in Scripture. Songs have been written about it. It says, the joy of the Lord is our, our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Now think about that. What does it mean that the joy of God, the joy of the Lord is our strength? You see, you see here's the first way out. Uh, the first way out that I resist temptation is I live such a deeply satisfying life that the experience of being... I live such a joyous life with God, united to God, connected to God, that being torn away from God in any way is, is not attractive to me. I believe, I really do believe, I believe experiencing the authentic, God-honoring joy may be the single greatest weapon against temptation that a human being can have. On the other hand, I believe that continued joylessness, that's why grumbling is such a problem. I believe joylessness, this judgmental spirit, this idea that my life is just hard and there's no happiness to be founded, that joylessness is one of the greatest things that trips people up into falling for temptation the trap of our, of, the, our, of our enemy, the evil one. There's a statement that I read years ago. Dallas Willard wrote this years ago. I think it's one of the greatest statements on this ever made. He says, Failure to attain a deeply satisfying life always has the effect of making sinful actions seem good. Let me 
say that to you again and so you can get it deep into you. Failure to attain a deeply satisfying life always has the effect of making sinful actions look good. And folks, I've been at this long enough that I have watched people who are leaders in churches bail on God and do things that embarrass them, their families, and destroy churches because month after month, year after year, they lived a life that was so full of duty and so ground down with what needed to be done. They were so miserable. They couldn't trust God to take care of what needed to be done. They had to get it done themselves. They couldn't believe that he would care for them. That when the opportunity came for them to do something to bring a little joy and happiness into their life, they lived such miserable lives for such a long time that the fall was just inevitable. Here lies the strength of temptation. When I live a life where sin looks good to me, where doing something I know would destroy my family, destroy me, destroy my soul, begins look to me, good to me, temptation. Temptation has a great success rate in my life of leading me to sin. On the other hand, our success in overcoming temptation is way easier as I arrange my life to live a joyful life. For example, I mean, when, when people get caught in, in sexual kind of things that embarrass them and ruin their lives with sexual temptation, what's driving it? What's prompting it? It's, it's not as much physical as people would lead you to believe. Often it's, it's, it's loneliness, it's boredom, it's, it's, self, it's self-pity, it's adventure, it's It's self-esteem issues. And with all of that going on, if all I ever deal with is I just can't give in sexually, I'm trying really, really hard to resist this temptation, as long as I'm just focusing on what's on the surface, I'm not going to get to the root of it. And the root is is that there's pain in my life over something that I have neglected, and I've not acknowledged that, and I haven't brought it into the light the extent to which I live a life of authentic joy, then temptation. Temptation, which is always the offer of life. It's always the offer of what I think would be what I wanted, but in fact will lead me to death. It's the, it's the lure of, of fake joy, the illusion of joy, but never really joy extent, itself. The extent that I give in to the illusion of joy over real joy, that's the extent to which I'll fail. But if I build my life in a way that I live with authentic joy, this is really, really important. The joy of the Lord really is our strength. So the question I have for you is, what do you need to be doing to increase the joy the joy factor in your life. Where do you need to be working to allow the Spirit of God to develop the fruit of joy in your life? What do you need to do? What are the activities that when you're involved in them, you sense the authentic joy of God in your life? What are the relationships that when you're with those people, you experience authentic, God-honoring joy? What are those places? Maybe for, for you it's nature. I know many people that just the experience of being nature and seeing God all around them breathes joy and life into them. Maybe for you, uh, like it is for me often, it's music or it's relationships. It's being with people that breathe life into you and joy into you, who breathe good things into you. For some of us, it's worship. Maybe it's helping other people, serving other people. But maybe what you need to do over the next few weeks as you pray, God, lead me not into temptation and deliver me from my enemy, the evil one. A part of what you need to pray is, God, help me become a joyful person. God, produce in me the fruit of the spirit of joy. Help me find things in my life that lead to real joy, not fake joy. But let's be clear. You are responsible to arrange your life so that joy, the joy of the Lord, can be your strength. No one else will do that. You must do that. You must take the steps and do the work to work on figuring that out. If not, 
you are a ripe target for the enemy, the evil one. Okay, that's one. Maybe that's your next step, to begin to figure out how to live in authentic joy. The second way out is, you and I need to develop relationships of openness and accountability. Giving in to temptation always finds itself in hiddenness and darkness. And I just want to say this as clearly and directly as I know how. If you think you can handle the sin and temptation on your own, you are sadly deceived and dumber than a bug. If, if you try to him temptation, handle temptation on your own, you are going to fail. You need somebody in your life, somebody to which you can say, this is my deal, this is my struggle. I want you to know it. I want you to help me with it. And here's the thing. You have to arrange your life in such a way and develop relationships where you can say to somebody, here's where I struggle. Feel free to confront me on it. Feel free to help me on it. Pat me on the back when I get it right. Kick me in the other end when I need to get it, when I'm getting it wrong. I give you an open door in my life. When you're tempted, really tempted, you need someone. In 12-step groups, they talk about finding a sponsor. A sponsor is somebody that is just open to that, open to you 24 hours a day. You call me. Everybody needs one. You need somebody to call and say, I want to do this thing really bad. I need you to stop me. You need somebody that's going to say, okay, I'm on it. What do you need me to do? I will pray for you. I will come to you. I will help you. Don't go for this thing that will kill you. Now, folks, I'll just say to you, this ability to live in openness with people about our sin is one of the fundamental differences between authentic, real community relationships and the false kind that is just rampant in our world. One of the things about false community is this thing that people have about pretending like I'm okay and everything's all right and I don't struggle with anything. And it is just rampant in churches. Churches where people act like, I don't really struggle. Or when they talk about a struggle in their life, they'll talk about, I used to struggle with such and such, but now by the power of Jesus, I don't struggle anymore. In real community, people know I am just one moment, one slip away from destroying myself and my life. There's a monster inside of me that just craves certain things. Will you help me with my problem? Will you love me enough to hold me accountable? In real, biblical, honest Christian community, we realize we're just a bunch of people with temptation problems. I mean, look at the person next to you. Now, I mean, literally, turn and look at the person next to you. You are looking at a dirty, rotten sinner who has a huge temptation problem. And you know who they're looking at? They're looking at a dirt and rotten sinner as well who is one slip away embarrassing themselves and ruining their family and ruining their values and becoming something they're so ashamed of. And sometimes churches just like to pretend that they don't have a problem. And it's just death. It's just death. And in churches where truth and grace break through and where we say, look, we all have this problem. I've got a problem and you've got a problem and I will help you and you help me. We stand strong together. And as much as we can do that for each other, we recognize that we are all creatures. And we have an enemy who is working every day to lure us to our own death. You'll need help from God, but you will also need help from someone else. And maybe, for you, that's the next step you need to take this week. My question is, who, who knows what your temptation is? Who do you call when it gets really bad and you just find yourself grumbling and negative about everything? Who do you call when you want to do that thing that lives in hidden in, this, in darkness? Who do you call that will help you? If you can't come up with a name, then I challenge you to start praying about that today. When you pray this prayer, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from the evil one. You say, God, would you help me? Point me to people, bring a name to my mind, and help me develop that relationship to the point where I can be completely honest, where I can say to them, here's my deal. 
Here's what I need to be done with. I want you to help me. I want you to hold me accountable. If you have somebody like that in your life, then maybe this week is the time that you need to go and you need to have that conversation again. Let them know. This is a fundamental way out of temptation. And I know some of you are wrestling with it big time right now. And what I want to remember, I want you to remember these traps. These traps are, they're set and bugs voluntarily go in them to their death. And then like this one, they destroy not on themselves, they destroy their whole family. I want you to remember the next time you face temptation, and, and it may be in five minutes. I want you to remember the damage it will do to your soul, the damage it will do to you. Temptation will cause you to violate your integrity, destroy your marriage, create guilt and despair, interrupt your connection with God. Temptation will destroy you. And some of you are walking right toward it right now. And you need to stop. Maybe you've been battling temptation for a long time. Maybe you're discouraged. And maybe the truth is you've been giving in again and again. Maybe you're not even making much effort. Maybe, in fact, you've been lying to yourself that you can't help yourself. And maybe a part of the problem is you wonder when you come to church, is there enough grace for me? If there isn't enough strength for me, does God really love even me? The truth is he does. And there is strength and power for you to overcome it. But it begins by you realizing there really is a battle going on. You really do have an enemy. God really will help you, and he really will provide a way out. But you have to decide to make, take a next step. And as I end today, I want to pray with you and for you that we'll all take the step we need to take. Let's bow together. And now, Father in heaven, I pray for the people that are joined in, my brothers and sisters who've given time to be a part of, of, of this talk, to, to hear your word. I pray that you would help us take whatever step we need to take to deal with the temptation in our life from subtle things that destroy us just as much as the big things that will embarrass us. Father, help us deal with the temptation that pulls us from you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.